Thank you, Michael, and uh, thanks everybody for coming out bright and early this morning. Um, as, uh, as Michael said, I have had the wonderful privilege over the course of my career to have literally traveled around the world um, and uh, thinking about a lot of different water challenges, water problems, and also to spend some time learning so much from many of you and others out there who are really advancing some really audacious solutions. And I think uh, in, in your work and the work of many of the others, uh, we, we have the hope for the future that I want to talk about this morning. So during the past seven years, although I've worked on all kinds of different water issues around the world in trying to help farmers and cities and industries and governments to find more sustainable ways of managing water, during the last seven years I've focused rather intensively on the water scarcity issues and associated solutions to those, to those challenges. But I want to start with a little bit of historical context here. As we all know, we spent most of human history behaving as hunters and gatherers. And it's important to remember that, that when we think about hunters and gatherers, we usually think about we are in search of food. But for many of those tribes and clans and indigenous peoples, it was also a search for water. It was chasing water. And particularly if you lived in the semi-arid, the arid landscapes of the planet, like in Australia, that search for water was, was something that was always a challenge and the knowledge about where you could find the reliable water sources at different times of the year or during really dry years was a very important piece of traditional ecological knowledge. It was passed on from generation to generation. And so it's not surprising that peoples like the Aboriginal people of Australia have recorded that knowledge in their calendars, in their mythologies, in their songs, in their paintings as exhibited here and still very active today. And so this, this transfer of, of understanding of where the important water sources were continues to be handed down and, and conveyed from generation to generation. But of course, about 10 to 12,000 years ago, our relationship with water shifted quite dramatically. We became a sedentary civilizations in different pockets of the world. And what I mean by our relationship with water changed, instead of going out and looking for water or chasing water, we made a commitment, implicitly as it may be, that we were going to stay in place and that the water was going to have to come to us. Um, along with, with that, of course, is having to weather the vagaries of climate, again, from season to season, year to year. And of course, as we moved into the 20th century, we developed the capabilities of being able to change that availability of water in some fundamental ways. We learned how to build the large reservoirs, um, such as Hoover Dam completed in the 1930s on the Colorado River in the Western United States. These were immensely important projects because it was, we were able to change, uh, in, in essence, fundamentally change the seasons. We were able to capture high water flows during one time of the year and hold on to it and use it um, in other months of the year, say during the summer irrigation season. Some of these reservoir systems were so large that they were actually able to capture multiple years of the total runoff of these river systems and thereby giving, giving us a bit of a buffer to weather through a string of water short years. The capture of water enabled us, of course, to also greatly expand our agricultural endeavors. Uh, so this is the Imperial Valley of California, about close to 20% of the Colorado River's water flows into this irrigation district. That's, that's kind of mind-boggling to think about. But it literally enables us to grow lettuce in the desert. Um, as Brad Udall spoke in one of the sessions yesterday afternoon, for most of us, if, we ate, if we're eating salads, if we're eating lettuce, like we did last night, for those of you who joined the party, the chances are very, very likely that it came out of this part of California in southeastern Colorado along southeastern California along the Colorado River. And it's interesting to think about, and I don't know the story about how mankind uh, initially discovered that there was water also under the ground, but we did start to, of course, initially using hand dug wells to access shallow underground water, shallow alluvial aquifers primarily. Um, it enabled us to, to access additional water sources in that manner. And then, of course, in the middle of the last century, that capability, that technology expanded greatly, particularly with the availability of industrial scale pumps. And all of a sudden, we were able to access underground water from, from hundreds, if not thousands, of feet deep, such as here in the High Plains Aquifer in central Kansas. So I'm going to spend just a minute or two on this slide because it tells a really important story about water scarcity and how water scarcity emerges in a place. 
These are just two graphs from two places in the world. On the upper part is the Murray-Darling River System in southeastern Australia. On the bottom, the Colorado River System in the western United States. But I've looked at hundreds, literally hundreds of these kinds of graphs, and the relationship, the story, the history is largely the same. Um, sometimes different things happen at different, and during diff different decades, but the same general trend that I want to talk about um, remains the same in all of these places. And so the light blue in the background, of course, is water availability. Um, in these two river systems, highly variable from year to year, from decade to decade, um, periods of very, very high water, periods of very, very low. So to talk about averages in these places, of course, is somewhat, um, somewhat unhelpful, I guess. The darker trace on the bottom, the darker bluer trace, is the use of water from these systems. I want to be very clear that this is consumptive use, not just the withdrawals. This is the water that got withdrawn out of these river systems and didn't make it back into the river system um, after use. So this is consumptive use. So this is water that gets taken out of these river systems and depletes that available water source uh, for anybody who might be downstream or for things that depend upon the river ecosystem itself. What you see in both of these pictures, and again, I could show you hundreds of other graphs like these, is the gradual accumulation over time of that consumptive water use. And in both of these systems and a lot of others, we know that um, beginning quite, quite, a, quite a long time ago, decades ago, that we started to see ecological problems emerge in these river systems. When you start taking 30%, 50% of the water out of river ecosystem, you can expect that there are going to be very marked and, uh, and uh, in some cases quite severe ecological changes that, that take place. So the ecological changes began to accrue in these systems very early on, but as you can see in both of these graphs, eventually we got to the point where we were literally up against the ceiling of the water availability. Now in the upper graph of the Murray-Darling Basin, uh, that really came to roost uh, in what was called the Millennium Drought, also called the Big Dry in Australia, uh, that came on in the late 1990s. It was a, it was a drought of record. It was, nobody had ever seen anything like this before, and it lasted a long time, 10 to 12 years in some parts of Australia. You can see that the, not, the water availability dropped. In fact, it dropped to less than 40% of the long-term average in, in many of the parts of the river basin. And also, because there was not enough water available in storage and not enough water coming down off of the mountains, uh, the, the use, the consumptive use of that water had to change. There was simply no more water left. They had the capability of storing about two years of the total flow of the Murray-Darling in the reservoir system there. In the bottom graph of the Colorado River, we have more storage capacity, and so we were able to span through a longer sequence of dry years, and in fact, um, by many estimates, the last 15 years in the Colorado River Basin are unprecedented in the last 1,400 years. We know this from tree uh, dendrochronology and, and, other, uh, and other methods. So when you have the capability of storing maybe five years of the annual runoff of the Colorado River, you can span a gap, but even, even that storage um, has been running out uh, very, very quickly in the Colorado River system. And so what we see in reservoirs like Lake Mead behind Hoover Dam or upstream in Lake Powell behind Glen Canyon Dam is a gradually decreasing water level. We are digging into our bank account. We're digging into our water storage account in these big reservoirs. And so they've been going down gradually and quite precipitously actually since about 2000. They've dropped tens of meters um, in elevation. <coughs> um, of, of great calamity here, of course, is the fact that uh, because of the sharing of water among the seven states in the Colorado River Basin is that as that water level drops in Lake Mead, there are consequences for each of the states. And there is a rank and priority according to who feels the pain first. Arizona takes the first hit. But as those water levels drop, more, less and less water is going out to the individual states that are dependent upon it. The other thing that gets quite worrisome here is that, of course, these are large electricity generators. These are large hydropower facilities. <clears throat> and as that water level is dropping, the, the capability of these reservoirs, of these dams to generate hydropower decreases as well because of the inefficiencies in the, in the turbine capacities. And eventually, you can get to a point where you cannot generate hydroelectric power anymore at, at, uh, at Hoover Dam. Uh, because this is tied into the entire grid system throughout the southwestern United States, you can imagine um, some of the consequences there. So to say a little bit more, it's, um, so I showed you graphs that just suggest that it's accumulating consumptive use as compared to the relative water availability, and that is the definition of water scarcity. It's not just the lack of water availability, but the amount of use relative to that water availability. 
And so if we use this metric of depletion, depletion of the water basins, uh, this is a map that, uh, that we generated uh, a, a few months ago. And it tells a very, very interesting picture. So what you're seeing in the warm zones, in the yellows, the oranges, and the reds, are places where more than 75% of the renewable, replenished water supply, uh, more than 75% of it, of it is being consumptively used. So they're bumping up against the ceilings of the water availability in these basins. By the way, this is a computer model generated um, animation here. Uh, there are a number of places around the world, research institutes that are, that are keeping close track of the water accounts in many, many different river basins, lake basins, and aquifers around the world, of course. This one happens to come from Germany, from the University of Kassel, and this one's called Water Gap. A couple things that you'll notice about this map, two things I wanted to point out. One is that, of course, water scarcity is spreading and intensifying um, in many, many parts of the world. The other one, though, which you'll see here as it clicks over back to 1900, is that even a century ago, more than a century ago, there were places in the world where we already had faced those limits of the natural water availability, of the renewable water supply. And so we were already running out of water in a number of pockets around the planet. And so we've been dealing with this concept of water scarcity for a very long period of time. This map throws all the water uses together. Um, but what's important here is that this map doesn't look much different at all from the map that I showed you before. The map I showed you before was strictly irrigated agricultural consumptive use. Um, when you look across all the water scarce regions of the world and how water is being used in those regions, irrigated agriculture accounts for 90% of the total consumptive use. And so industries and domestic uses, manufacturing is a very, very small portion of the remaining use. So this map looks much like uh, the previous map does for that reason. <clears throat> when you do the accounting and, and uh, you see the different colors here, some of these places are running, are running up against the limits all of the time. In fact, some of them are over 100% use because they're mining their groundwater aquifers in addition to drying up their rivers. Um, but, but, and sometimes it's only a seasonal shortage, um, only during perhaps the summer irrigation season that they're really up against that, the, the limits of the available water. And sometimes it only comes during drier years or during drought. So that's what the color coding is here. We now know that water scarcity and associated water shortages are taking place in about a third of all the planet's watersheds, rivers, lakes, and underground aquifers. About half the world's population is already being affected by these water shortages. And most frightening, I think, is the fact that about three quarters of the world's irrigated acreage is dependent upon these places where, again, we're up against the limits of the renewable water supply. Um, for those of you living from the United States, um, this is a little bit of a closer view. This is a different model, a little bit more detail here, but, but basically portraying the same thing. This is depletion. This is consumptive use um, as compared to the water availability. And what you see in the Western United States is a very, very heavy degree of utilization of the available water supply. And in fact, this, this, this statistic, when we put this together, was, really caught me by surprise. So half of the rivers in the western United States have lost half of their water, and a quarter have lost more than three quarters of their water. So what that means is that fundamentally, these river systems that, are, that have experienced that degree of exhaustion of the renewable water supply, they're fundamentally different rivers. They're ghost images of the rivers that used to exist. Uh, there was a couple of great sessions yesterday afternoon with some of the scientists, some of the river scientists, some of the ecologists talking about the nature of those changes that have taken place in, um, over time in these places and the challenges of trying to think about concepts like ecosystem restoration or are we really just going to try to make, make the best that we can out of the water that we still have left in these places. So because we had not seen anybody really putting um, the picture together in any kind of a quantitative or a statistical sense. Uh, in a report that we put out uh, last year called Watershare, um, published by the Nature Conservancy, we portrayed a lot of this information, a lot of these maps, but one of the things that we did was we wanted to see whether or not there was a, a quantitative connection between the degree to which the renewable water supplies were being depleted and the occurrence of bad things happening. So what I mean by bad things happening is I've had my students at the University of Virginia have been putting together a database, working on this for, for a few years now, documenting credible sources where water shortages occurred and documenting what happened. 
manufacturing plants shutting down, uh, power generating plants um, losing capacity, not being able to produce at full capacity or having to shut down altogether. Agricultural disruption, um, not able to bring in the crops um, along with not only the agricultural production but of course the revenue generation associated with that. Um, the ecological impacts um, associated with fish kills and, and other and other well-documented events. And so, not surprisingly, as these graphs suggest, there is a correlation. There is a statistical correlation between the degree to which you're depleting the, the available water resources and your vulnerability to having a water shortage event. So, no surprise, of course, that now the World Economic Forum has put this issue, water shortage crises, right at the top of their global risks to the global economy. And it's because these things are happening, again, in more and more places, and they're getting more and more painful. And um, I think this is something that's become a very, very serious issue and something that we're all, of course, trying to grapple with and trying to figure out how can we ameliorate this? How can we reduce this? How can we stop this from happening in so many places? So one of the approaches, of course, in the 20th century was to, once you've depleted your local water supply and once the reservoirs can no longer you know, get you through, uh, your water shortages uh, or to meet your increasing water demands, we have reached out into other basins. We have built long distance water transfer projects, such as this one, I think one of the most uh, illustrative of this idea, if, if you will, is um, in China. This is a south north water diversion project, of course. This takes water out of the southern part of the country, specifically out of the Yangtze River Basin, and transports the water to the northern China Plain and the associated cities, Beijing and other cities that benefit from this up in the North China Plain. Uh, the North China Plain, of course, being the breadbasket, the primary agricultural production area of China. Um, I don't think that these projects are going to be very useful for too, to, for too much longer in the 21st century. Um, they're very, very expensive, not only from the construction cost, this one was about 80 billion plus at this point, um, but, the, but to move that water against gravity over long distances and water having the weight that it does and the volume of water being moved, it just it becomes very, very expensive water. Another problem with these water transfer schemes is that there's really not much surplus water left. You know, the maps that I just showed you suggest that we're running out of water in a lot of parts of the map, a third of the map. And so if you're in a water scarce basin, you're gonna to have to reach a long ways to get into places where there might be some extra water available to bring in, to import. And we're also seeing many communities resisting those kinds of proposals, saying, no, we're not gonna let you take our water. We're gonna need, our, we're gonna need that water for our water security in the future. I think the New York Times told the story about this particular project in a very um, telling way. They said, this project is like taking water out of the Missouri River to supply the water to Washington, D.C., New York, and Boston. So about 1,000 kilometers of distance, and, and you get some sense of the volume of water from that. So I don't think that this is going to be a viable option, and certainly not to meet the irrigation needs um, of the 21st century. Uh, in a lot of places in the world, of course, we're tapping into this technology, desalination, removing salts from salty water, whether it's underground salty saline um, aquifers or whether it's coming directly out of the ocean. Um, again, the real constraint here, even though this is a rapidly expanding technology, it still remains a very, very small portion of the overall global water supply, something on the order of 2 to 3%. And it remains very, very expensive. From, so from the standpoint of the water needs of irrigated agriculture, it's very expensive water. And there are only a few places in the world um, outside of Bahrain and perhaps Saudi Arabia where the, or, and, uh, and a couple of other places where this is going to be a feasible way to meet the irrigation needs of the future. We've done a lot of, uh, and we and a lot of you have done um, cost analyses, relative you know, benefit cost um, assessments for, related to water, the cost of water, the economics associated with water. This is just one city, um, a story that I'm going to tell you a little bit more about in just a moment. But San Diego has looked at a large variety of options, I mean, an array of different ways of supplying their growing water demands over time. And these per unit costs and the relative expense between the different options that are available here. Again, they repeat themselves in many, many of the places, cities and others that we've looked at around the world. So again, salt water or desalination being out on the high end of the spectrum. Even water reuse and re water recycling being quite expensive as well because of the water treatment costs, the electricity associated with that. 
um, and the expense that comes with the uh, provision of the electricity. Water importation you see there. Uh, groundwater, local surface water, these are, these are sources that were very, very important and relatively cost effective early on in the development of the water supply systems of San Diego and many other cities around the world, but, uh, but much of that is no longer available to meet the growth of the future. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend the rest of my time really talking about where I see the future, uh, where I see the 21st century, and where I think we have to double and triple down, all of us, in the next couple of decades, and talking about water conservation. I talked about a lot of these issues in a book that I published a couple of years ago called Chasing Water. I talked about the governance structures that are going to be needed, um, such as putting caps, um, limits on the total uh, use, consumptive use of water from any water source. I talked about some of the economic drivers, some of the financial incentives that might be available to us, um, the different things that local communities are going to have to grapple with in planning for a water secure future. But for the rest of my, for the, the, the remaining few minutes here, I'm going to focus just on the actual activities that need to take place on the ground in our cities and out on our farms if we're going to come to grips with this problem of global water scarcity. So the first solution I'm going to talk about is this idea of creating water, and I don't mean desalinating water here. Um, instead, what I mean is that by saving water, for every gallon that we don't consume is water available for other users or to remain in the natural ecosystems in the hope of being able to restore some of the ecological vitality of some of those uh, freshwater ecosystems and the downstream estuary and near coastal zones as well. Um, so this idea of creating water is about just simply not using it in the first place, and as you saw from that previous slide, um, by far and away the most cost-effective means to try to balance a water budget that's getting out of, out of balance. So let me say a little bit about what's going on in cities already, and then I think we need to greatly, greatly expand our endeavor here. Um, this isn't a problem in all the cities of the world, of course. Uh, it's, this is usually an issue for more of the industrialized um, countries of the world, but but the fact that we use half of the water in cities in places like the Western United States or in Australia, half of the water in many of these cities going to outdoor landscaping use, um, around the home, big commercial parks, golf courses and that sort of thing, this is the place that we obviously have to take a look. There's an interesting piece of research that was done at the University of California at Davis a couple of years ago that compared water use in Australian cities to water use in, in Western United States cities, and they found that in the Western US, our cities are using twice as much water as the, as the cities in Australia. So right there tells us that there's tremendous potential um, to go a lot farther with our water conservation programs. Um, I think the water utilities within the Western United States are gonna have to take this very seriously, and the communities that depend upon the, that water supply and on those water utilities are really going to have to push for this. This is going to be a very, very important part. Even though cities are a small portion of the overall water scarcity problem, it's critically important that everybody is involved in this, and the cities really need to get serious and get their water use down to about, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the liter conversion right off the top of my head. I guess if I said 50 gallons, that would be about 200 liters um, per person per capita. Fortunately, there's some progressive cities in, in different parts of the world that are embracing this challenge, that have, that have really come to grips with this, and they're saying, we need to put a lid on our growing water demands. In other words, our water demands cannot grow any further, and in fact, they actually need to come down. Um, and there's good evidence in a lot of cities that have been able to accomplish this uh, through implementing various water conservation, water efficiency measures, of course, things like repairing leaking water pipes and distribution systems is a big part of this in almost all uh, larger cities of the planet. But uh, there, are, there is a move now to actually create ordinances to pass legislation that would call for putting a freeze on what has been a long-term increasing trend in water use. I'm going to turn now to something that's of great interest, I know, to all of you being at this conference, and that is some of the opportunities that are out on the farms. So in the irrigation literature in the last few years, there's been some very sharp criticisms of the claims that we can actually save water out in irrigated agriculture. And I think these criticisms has been, have been very valid. And I think they've been very, very helpful. They've been very useful for calling attention to the fact that we have to do a much better job of keeping track of the water budgets out in these farming communities if we really want to understand how much savings are actually potentially available to us and where's that water going. 
um, the water that's, that's not being applied to the farm. Unfortunately, much of the, of the claims associated with potential water savings in irrigated agriculture has talked only about the reduction in the water that needs to be withdrawn out of the river or pumped from the ground or taken out of a lake. It has not paid adequate attention to the, the fact that much of that water came back into that original water source through what's called return flow. And so we are overstating the potential for water savings if we're not accounting for the fact that some of that water that was applied actually made it back into the water source. And so we didn't really save it, it just never got used. Okay? It's important not to withdraw so much water because there's a lot of energy, you know, a lot of electricity you know, typically connected to that. And there's a lot of labor and, and other things that are, that are tied to that. But we really need to pay much closer attention to this. And so with a group, a large group of student researchers at the University of Virginia over the last couple of years, we really drilled hard on this. Um, we really scrutinized th literally thousands of papers from around the world and looked for only the most credible evidence um, where they actually paid attention to these issues of how much water was being saved from the consumptive use of the water. And by the way, oftentimes, and at this conference, there was a lot of, a lot of discussions about the opportunities to implement water efficiency measures and other ways of saving water in order to increase agricultural produ productivity. And that is a very, very important endeavor in many places in the world. Um, but what we tried to look at here was only on the water saving potential. And so another condition, another criteria for our review was if you hold production constant, how much water can be saved. So when you have both of those things going on, if you're increasing agricultural productivity, the chances of saving water become diminishing, diminishingly small, and some of our scientific colleagues would say impossible. Um, so if you're going to talk about arresting water scarcity, then you're going to have to pay attention to what are you going to do about productivity, um, the agricultural productivity there, okay? Even with that said, here's some pretty impressive results. Even when we put that very, very fine screen filter and scrutiny on these studies, um, the potential for saving water by, because of the way that we're applying it, um, many people have been working on this, there's many companies and manufacturers that have been promoting this. It turns out that in carefully controlled field studies um, that there is a lot of potential. A third to a half um, of the water, of the consumptive use can be reduced through water applications. By the way, this paper should be online any day, literally any day, um, in the, uh, the global journal called Water Policy, for those of you that are interested in this. Or you can just talk to me afterwards and I'd be happy to send you a copy. Managing soil health, becoming, um, getting a lot more attention, thank goodness, um, because it has many, many uh, desirable qualities in terms of agriculture productivity and also reduced pollution coming off of these farm fields, but it also has a proven water benefit because if the soil is able to, if the soil is healthier, it's able to retain much more moisture, considerably more moisture, and that requires then less irrigation. And so you can see some real savings in consumptive use there. This idea of shifting crops, um, I heard a couple of talks yesterday afternoon about some of the challenges here, and I don't want to downplay any of these challenges. Realizing these kinds of water savings is not going to be easy, and it's not going to be flipping a switch with farmers um, or, or what they're producing out on, out on the ground. But there is some real potential here, and so I think farming communities as well as national governments are now going to need to start paying attention to the question of should we really be growing this in this place? Um, are there other things that we could grow that might use less water, that might provide better nutrition for our population, that might actually generate more revenue for the farmers? Um, that's a difficult win-win-win to try to resolve. I'll be the first to admit that, but I think the potential might be there, and, and we have to start taking a look at it. And the savings can be quite large. Um, but again, uh, the, the cultural um, the social challenges, the economic challenges associated with making these kinds of shifts and whether the markets exist to be able to make these kinds of shifts are big questions, as you all know. The last one I want to talk about is this concept of sharing water. And the point I want to emphasize here is that we can't resolve these issues by, by remaining insularly focused only on one user sector, by focusing only on irrigated agriculture, by focusing only on the opportunities to, gen to generate or to use less water in power generation, the ability to use less water inside the city. We need to find ways to build dialogues and have conversations around the shared water source, around the river basin that we share, around the lake basin, the groundwater aquifers that we share, and we need to look at ways that we might be able to um, distribute 
to the, the rights to use that water, the availability of that water among all, everybody who's, who's trying to use it um, and trying to put it, uh, put it into, into productive use or to meet their basic uh, human livelihood needs. So I want to just illustrate this concept um, with one story. This isn't a perfect story, I'll tell you that. If you dig in behind the, behind the, uh, uh, the, the, the cover and, and uh, you know, the headlines here, um, there are some real challenges still remaining, but I just use this story to try to illustrate where some of the potential is. So the city of San Diego, as I showed you, has explored a lot of different options for meeting their future water supply. Um, they are becoming more and more concerned with their dependence on importing water from great distances from Northern California or from the Colorado River. And so they are exploring a lot of other options. They just built one of the biggest uh, desalination plants in North America recently. But in the late 1990s, they started to explore an option that I think is a really, really interesting story. So they looked over to the east and they saw the Imperial Irrigation District and the fact that the Imperial Irrigation District is using 20% of the Colorado River's water. And they said, I wonder, they said let's go have a, have a chat and see whether or not we can work with that district to try to find ways to help the district use less water, to consumptively use less water, and free up some of that water for use in San Diego. And so that is what has unfolded. Uh, the city of San Diego now pays those farmers over in the Imperial Irrigation District uh, more than $60 million per year, and they've been doing this for some time now. Um, that enables the farmers to improve the farms, monitoring the instrumentation, the way that they irrigate, uh, lining canals and ditches, shifting crops, fallowing fields in some cases as well. Um, an important aspect here is the fact that the decisions about how to save the water was entirely in the farmer's hands. The city didn't dictate how this is going to be done. The city didn't want to do that. They don't know how to do that. The farmers know how they can save water, how it's going to be culturally and economically viable for them to do so. Um, and so the farmers made those decisions about how they were going to do it, but the important part of that story is that that water being saved in the Imperial Irrigation District now supplies a third of San Diego's water supply. So this is an illustration of my point, that when you start to look for possibilities, when you stop thinking as a water utility manager and all you're thinking about is, can I build another pipeline into some other place? Can I build a new water desalination plant? And you start to think about everybody who's dependent upon that water source that you're also dependent upon, it might open up some really interesting possibilities. And I think we should be seeing a lot more of this, and I think we're going to have to see a lot more of this in order to resolve these problems of water scarcity going forward. So I'll conclude with this. These are the highlights of what I've just talked about over the last half hour. We, uh, about a third of our water sources, rivers, lakes, and aquifers, are being very, very heavily utilized. About 90% of that consumptive use is going out to irrigated farms. About 10% is going to cities and industries. Uh, the result for the natural ecosystems for those water bodies themselves is uh, very, very heavy depletion uh, to the point of drying up. Um, in some cases, or rapidly declining groundwater levels in many other places. So as we look out over the next couple decades, I really think that we all have to intensively focus, and I think governments are going to have to really push hard on this and get really serious about this, and we have to do this now um, to really begin to arrest uh, the, the, the spreading and, and intensification of water scarcity around the planet. Over the next couple of decades, I think those, some of these measures that I've just talked about are the ones that we have to really do a lot of um, in a lot of places. And so out on the irrigated farms, we're going to have to use much less. And I've illustrated just a couple ways that I think are feasible for doing that. The cities are going to have to be serious about freezing, capping uh, their rising demands over water and even lessen their consumptive use or their, their withdrawals and consumptive use over time. And I think a good portion of that savings, we're going to have to think about how do we get that, how do we leave that within the river or the lake, um, or how do we get it back into those systems so that we can begin to rebuild some of the, the life on the planet that's dependent upon that fresh water as well. So thank you very much for your attention. And those of you that want to hear more, um, I hope you'll find the book of interest. Thank you very much. <laughs>